2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Probably tonight will be the final night on the series of the heart. Y'all should be experts in it now. You've had enough passages on it, and I'm sure that you have applied everything that you've learned that's in the Bible. And now you're hoping and praying that you get a chance to get on to Jeopardy. And that the favorite category will be the heart. It's a blessing when the Lord makes the Bible so clear and plain for us to be able to understand that there's hope for us to be able to understand the magnificence of the things that are in it. Second Corinthians chapter number 9, we're talking about the acts of your your will, your heart, the determining factors. How you think does matter. Amen. Uh, it's not a psychological or psychiatric problem. It's a matter of the heart. You have to learn to think like God thinks. As time progresses and things continue to move in the direction as we spoke about briefly this morning, you're going to see more and more that it will be harder and harder for you to fit in. Not because of outward appearance but because you don't think like the rest of the world thinks. You don't see things through their eyes or their perspective, and so therefore, you can look as a result of that for some persecution to come your way. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, look if you will please, we'll pick it up in verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that he always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Brother Justin, again, I apologize for this morning, but I appreciate it if you'd open us in a word of prayer, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I realize it's an unusual verse to open up with a verse on giving, but it's not so much as opening up on a verse on giving as much as it is to show you that what God cares about is not how much you give, but how you give it. The way that you see fit to do what God would have you to do when it comes to giving and doing the things that God wants you to do, not just of your time, I mean of your money, but of your time and of your talent. What he says, let every man give according as he purposeth in his heart. In other words, the decision is made in your heart as to what it is that you want to do. I guess you might even be able to say how grateful you are for what the Lord's done for you. It's hard for somebody to love without giving. But it's okay. Many people say, well, I can give without loving. You can, but you can't love without giving. Look, if you will, please, in Acts chapter number 5 along these lines so that you might better understand that God's looking on our heart. Remember over in 1 Samuel that uh, David's over there, not David, but uh, the preacher's over there, and he's picking out who's going to be the next king. He's ready to get the anointing take place. And the Lord says to him, he said, listen, he said, uh, I don't look at people the way God does. Man, he calls him. I don't look at him the outward appearance. Man looks upon the outward appearance. God looketh upon the heart. He says about David over in the book of Acts, he said that David was a man after mine own heart. He said when he, the Lord, removed Saul, he put David in there. Do you realize he used David after David sinned? Do you ever think about that? You say, why? His heart got right. David recognized and repented. And I'll confess to you that the sin was a terrible sin, murder and adultery. That's a, a bad thing. He used Moses after he committed murder there. He used the Apostle Paul who committed multiple murders and, and did things like that. Because why? God's looking upon the heart of an individual. The secret to having a successful Christian life is to make sure your heart and God's heart is lined up together. In other words, the way you think and the way God thinks. Now, you understand, as I mentioned to you in the introductory remarks, that when you get ready to face the world today, when you face it tomorrow, when you turn on the news in the morning, if that's what you start your day with, you're going to recognize right off the bat that what God said to you today is not going to jive with what you're going to hear tomorrow. 
and you're going to get out in the world. And once you get out into the world, the people around you, whether they're at school, whether they're on summer vacation, whether they happen to be at work, they're completely, uh, I would say, disconnected from things that are spiritual at all. So you might come in and say, hey, we had good church services yesterday, had good choir practice yesterday, had some good singing yesterday, a little bit of preaching yesterday. Things went really good. And they're like, what is that what you do on Sunday? Man, we get up and read the newspaper and drink hot chocolate and uh, we spend some time together doing, I mean, Sunday's our only day off. And right off the bat, you know what you're going to notice? A disconnect. God says that when you're giving him a setting aside a day for him, you know what you're doing? You're saying to him, hey, Lord, you know what? You're a big portion of my life and you matter. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that when you tithe, that's a testimony that the Lord is alive. I'm not giving you a sermon on tithing. We don't even have to preach on that around here. God has continually provided for what we need and has taken good care of things. You say, why? I believe your heart's right. If your heart's right, it doesn't make any difference about the amount. Remember that the Lord's talking there. He's standing one day and the boys are all watching people as they do. Good Baptists are watching who's putting money in the plate. And there's a couple of guys that come up and they throw in enough money to choke a horse and that kind of thing. He's like, man, Lord, that's a lot of money in there. And a lady comes up and she drops two mites in there, about the equivalent of two pennies. Not much money at all. And uh, the Lord said she gave more than the rest of them. Now, how would that be? Well, it's because she gave all that she had, or was it because her heart was, Lord, I wish I had more, I wish I could do more, but what I do have, you can have. Do you ever wonder why when he looks at Mary, he makes the statement and makes a memorial to Mary, when it says to her, she hath done what she could, you realize she gave all she had? Do you think it was just because of the spike nerd inside the alabaster box that the Lord was impressed with? I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That'd be like you trying to give the Lord, you know, a thousand dollars and thinking that it was something. The Lord's not looking at the price of the spike nerd that is inside the alabaster box. He's looking at the heart of the woman that is saying, this woman is willing to pour herself out on me and do whatever she can do. That's why he says, not she hath given what she could give. He says about her, she hath done what she could because he's looking at her heart. Listen, if you have the right heart, the Lord's not worried about the monetary things. He's not looking at that. You have the right attitude, no matter what it is, whether it's to write a poem, whether it's to write a text message, whether it's to write a, a letter or write a hymn, as Brother Sam mentioned to you, to be able to sing or to be able to play an instrument or to preach a sermon. It's just will you do what you can do. Do you make an effort on a daily basis to just do what you can do? I can tell you this, it takes effort if your heart's not in it. If your heart's not in it, you know what's going to be hard for you to do? It'll be hard for you to read your Bible in the morning. You figure, man, I had enough of that yesterday, man. I mean, I didn't think the guy was ever going to shut up. And he said more words in 45 minutes or an hour than I would say in an entire week's period of time. I couldn't believe that. And I heard all these hymns and stuff like that. And you know what? If your heart's not in it, tomorrow's going to be a struggle for you. But if your heart's in it, you'd be surprised. You'll get up in the morning and go, okay, Lord, I, I want to do what's right to do today. And the Lord said, good, grab you about five or six verses and read them a couple of times. Meditate it on all day. And I'll tell you what we can do. How about you and I have something to talk about? Ooh, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, you can get something in common with the Lord because you're talking to the author of the book. And so if you just get you four or five verses and say, hey, Lord, can you tell me what you mean by this? Don't be in a hurry to grab a commentary. Don't be in a hurry to, to go over there and see what somebody else says or to run something on the, the search thing or whatever it is. They say, Lord, can we talk about these verses right here? Start with this, start with John eleven thirty five. 35. I've yet to get to the bottom of it. Jesus wept. Ask him about it. Talk to him about it. Lord, what about it? You say, what are you doing? Oh, see, you didn't even realize I got you praying now. But you're not praying, Lord, you know, get me out of my mess and Lord, fix the problem I got and Lord, send me some finances and Lord, straighten out my kids and Lord, help me make a decision. You're talking to him about something that he is expressly interested in. He is interested in his word or he wouldn't have written it and preserved it. He preserved it forever, the Bible says. Not one jot or one tittle will pass away. Is that what he says? So the heart becomes the issue or the interesting thing that if you would spend some time getting your heart lined up with his heart, you'd be surprised how much easier the Christian life then becomes because it's something that you desire in your heart. Are you in Acts chapter 5? Let's talk again about giving. Here's the Ananias and Sapphira story. Most everybody knows this. A certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. 
and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan... Does that shake you up right there? Filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land. Now you understand he didn't have to give it all. The problem is, is that he decided to keep it back but act like he gave it all. Because he has a heart problem. Why did you let Satan get in your heart and crowd the Holy Spirit out to the point that you're lying as if the Holy Spirit doesn't know? We wouldn't have any way of knowing whether you gave it all or didn't give it all. But there's a problem. Brother Roger, turn the air conditioner on, please. But there's a problem. And the problem exists over the fact that the heart has to be vacated. I'll point up here. Has to be vacated in order to make room for Satan. Take, leave your Bible, leave your finger right here for just a minute. Come over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. And I know most of you are familiar with this. You say, what can happen? Your heart can be possessed. Your heart can be possessed. You say, no, I didn't say your soul. I said your heart can be possessed. You say, by what? By the devil. He just said, why did you let Satan fill your heart? Why did you allow Satan to have the ground inside your heart that caused you to have the wrong thought process that enabled you to lie against the Holy Ghost, not just lie to the brethren, but now you've lied against the Holy Ghost. It's a demonic possession of your thought process. Amen. And preacher, you make too much of a deal about these things about the devil and the ghoulie monsters and this and that and the other. I don't make a big enough deal about it, but I don't like the fool with it. Amen. I mean, I mean, if there is one thing that does call me great fear and trembling, it's messing around with the devil. I just don't, I don't like to fool around with it, but it's a necessity. You say, why? The Bible teaches you over in the book of Ephesians that there's a way for you to give ground or to give place to the devil. That's found in Ephesians chapter number 4. Does that not bother you at all? You have the ability in the next chapter there, I mean, at the end of that chapter, you know what you have the ability to do? To grieve the Holy Spirit. That means that you can cut off your connection because of what's in your heart with the Lord speaking to you and crowding out the wrong kinds of ways of thinking. We're talking about the thought process, process not the thing under your breastbone. Look, if you will, please, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, the Bible says this in verse number 10, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Why? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Where is that forgiveness taking place? It's taking place in your heart. It's not a physical action of things. You say, what happens? If I'm not willing to do that, now what I've done is I've thrown the doors open, I've thrown the gates open, and I've allowed the devil to come in and corrupt my way of thinking. Now let me just show you where that gets precedent. That gets precedent, law first mentioned, over there in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter number 3. In Genesis chapter number 3, here's what happens. Eve is obviously looking at the tree, right? Okay, and the devil simply walks up and implants a thought in her mind. And she says, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, the Lord said this. And the devil said, yea, hath God said? And just plant a little seed in there. Well, let me ask you a question. When the seed is sown, and when you're over there in the New Testament, in the Gospels there around Mark chapter number 7, doesn't he say some fell on the good ground? Right. Doesn't he tell you the ground is your heart? Right. And then he says some on the stony ground, and some on the ground with thorns and thistles that come out and choke it out because of the persecution, and some throw, uh, throw, throw, throw on the stony ground, some goes on the thorns and the thistles, and some by the wayside that the birds come and gather it up, the birds gather it up before it can take root into your heart. Right. You say, where's your heart? He's not talking about down here. He's talking about before you can change how you think, the devil's interested in taking that thought away from you. You have to protect how you think. And you say, why? Because that's the devil's playground. Back, if you will, please, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 5. You should have kept your finger there. I hope you did. If not, come to Acts chapter number 5. Now watch. Satan hath Satan filled... Thine heart. To fill is to completely fill it. Is that right? If I had a glass up here somewhere, or let's just say I had a bottle, uh, if this bottle was half empty and then I filled it up, then you would say the bottle's full. You know what he said? Satan hath filled thine heart. Well, if that's the case, then your heart must have been empty. 
And then notice, if you will, please come down to verse number four. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto... You know what he just said? He said the problem was in his heart. And preacher, why are you capping off the capstone with that? Because you don't understand that how you think does matter. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew chapter number 15 shows you that that's where all the things that are bad in you come out. It's how you think about those things. It does make a difference, ladies and gentlemen, and I realize the Bible teaches you, come to Romans chapter number one, uh, the Bible teaches you that Daniel, when Daniel was over in uh, chapter number one of Daniel, do you remember that Daniel uh, said about him, Daniel purposed where? In his heart. You know what he said? He said, hey, I, I can't eat the king's meat. You know what he is in essence saying? I'm going to do what I believe is right to do. There are my convictions between me and God, and God's either going to protect me or I'm willing to die for that. I would say his mind is made up. His heart is set, and he's willing to say, hey, I don't want to eat that, and Lord, I'm hoping you provide a way. You know what I would say about the three Hebrew children? Their heart was set. Well, if God delivers us, He's God. And if He doesn't deliver us, He's still God. But you do with us whatever you want to do with us. You say, why? There was a point in their mind where their heart was filled with the right thing. You struggle in your Christian life because you're not, your heart is not filled with the right thing. You see, it can't be that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> but it's hard to get there, isn't it? You say, why? I don't know about you, but it's constantly the, this pressure on a regular basis to change the way you think about things. Do you ever notice that? They run all kinds of uh, articles. They run all kinds of commercials and all kinds of advertisements. And they're always trying to show you how unhappy you are and what you need to make you happy. And they're trying to influence not your actions, how you think. Right? It's a biblical principle. But if my heart is already set and it's already full, I'm less likely to be influenced by the wrong things. Boys, this is what's important for you when it comes to your marriage. If your heart's not full of love for your wife, there's enough room in there for a little beetle to get in and cause some real damage. You say, why? You keep your heart full. You know what happens? You're not worried about turning your head when you ought not. Ladies, I mean, maybe the husband that you got, maybe he needs some work. I mean, you know, been 41 or 42 years now and, and still getting some work done and things like that. But uh, don't give up yet. He ain't done. Stay with it a little while longer. But you know what? If you let all of a sudden all you do is murmur and you gripe and you complain and all the things he doesn't do and all the things he doesn't do compared to somebody else that you think is great because you see him on church on Sunday and it looks like everything is wonderful and great. You don't see what's going on Monday through Saturday. All you do is see the show they put on here. And she comes in and she's got a new purse and some new shoes and not a new piece of jewelry and she's driving a new car and you're thinking, boy, I sure wish I was married to him. But you may not realize those are trade-offs on a regular basis. He's having to buy her something because he's messed up again. Maybe that's... I'm being honest. You say, well, that's kind of funny. No, no, you don't know what it is. You have no idea what goes on behind closed doors. Just because you see something, you know what happens? You start letting all of a sudden that glass that's full, you start letting it get down a little bit. Then you start looking at these other women and you're thinking, well, how come they have that? And why does she have this? And why you don't know what... Uh, 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 trouble she's dealing with at the house. You have no way of knowing that. But you say, what happens? You begin to make the comparison. You know what got the devil in trouble? He said, you know something? I know the Lord made the ruler over the earth here, and I'm the fifth cherub that covers, and I know I've been given the earth, and I know I'm, I'm leading God's choir and stuff up here. But you know what? I, I, I believe I need to take his throne, and I believe I need to be like the Most High God. And I believe I want, see how envy comes in? You say, what? And his heart, till iniquity was found in thee. You say, what happened? He got his heart turned. Are you beginning to see the picture now? Your heart being full, ladies and gentlemen, with the right reason and the right things, it gives you protection, supernatural protection. It keeps you from being, it's like making you, it's like giving you a suit of Teflon. And then the world throws the stuff at you and you wonder how these people are able to walk through that. Their heart's already full. If you're already full, listen, I love cinnamon rolls. 
and key lime pie and ice cream with magic shell and biscuits with about five or six pats of butter and, you know, and, and syrup. I, I love that. But when I'm full, as much as I might like to have that, there ain't no more room for it. My mom and daddy, when I was growing up, my mom and daddy never gave me dessert first. I'd weigh 900 pounds. You say, why? Well, because if you eat all that first, you're not going to eat the other. So what did you have to do? You had to eat salad and you had to eat green beans and broccoli and all the other kind of things and get all that first. And there wasn't as much room left for dessert. You know, you're thinking when you the pie is sitting on the table, you're thinking, man, I'm going to eat the whole pie. But by the time you get around to the dessert course, it's like a little bit goes a long way. So you see how sin creeps into our life oftentimes is not because we're tempted because we're continually looking. It's because there's a void or a vacancy in the heart that's already there that should be full. The Lord tells you over there that He wants your joy to be full. That's found over in the book of John, chapter number 14. Why does He want me to be full of joy? Because if I'm full of joy, I'm less likely to be griping and complaining and murmuring about something I don't have. Well, what about the tree? Well, what about the tree? I don't know, man. I'm so full of eating all these other trees. I don't care about that tree. Right? It's when that thing gets vacant. And guess what comes in? That root of bitterness can come in. And anger and wrath and strife and emulation can come in. You say, why? If that thing's full to the top, there ain't no room for that stuff to get in. Or I'll show you this. It's less likely to get in if you can just keep that full. Well, you know what happens here in Romans, or in Acts chapter number 5 is, is the devil came into a vacant place there in Ananias and Sapphira's part, and the Lord rolls them up there, and they're taken out and buried. Look at this thing in Romans chapter number 2, verse number uh, 4. O oh, despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and the forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of righteousness, judgment of God. I'm in Romans chapter 2. We're coming to Romans 1 in a second, but I want you to notice that. Listen, the hardness and penitent heart now comes, treasures up unto thyself wrath. Why? Because your heart was hard, the right stuff couldn't get in, therefore the wrong stuff or the results of the wrong stuff winds up resting upon you. Nobody in here gets chastised whenever they don't deserve it. God knows exactly when to chastise us and we get exactly what we've sown and can I say this, less than we deserve from what we don't, what we, uh, what we should get. Alright, Romans chapter number 1. Great passage here. Look in verse number 21. <laughs> Notice where the problem is. This is uh, a, uh, a, a statement on the United States of America today. Verse number 21, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their, and the foolishness, their foolish, how about that? You say, what was that? Their thought process. You say, what? Tell me I'm not right. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Would you agree they kind of emptied the tank out? Neither were they thankful. So guess what happens? They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. But it doesn't stop there. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of an uncorruptible God to an image made and likened to a corruptible man, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own minds, or their own ways, of their own doing. No, where is it? The lust of their own what? to dishonor their own bodies between them and themselves. Now, why? They changed the truth of God into a lie, worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, and so on and so forth. Therefore, God gave them up. Now, where is their problem? The reprobate mind comes from a reprobate heart. And because they've changed into how they want to see it instead of how God sees it, there's now plenty of room in there to replace God with man's humanism or with satanic thoughts or being. And in the context of the passage here, it's outright bald face, in your face, sin against the holy God. So much so that the Lord looks into their mind and He looks down into the recesses of their heart here and He said, there is nothing in there that is worth anything. I'm going to 
give them up to that reprobate mind. You say, where'd it come from? It started over there when the Lord gave them up because of their heart, the foolish heart was darkened. They turned the lights out. And so if we learn from that, then what we'll do, come to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. <coughs> what you learn from that is, is that you have greater control over your own actions than you think. You really do. When the Bible goes in, it affects your heart. I told you that this morning from Hebrews chapter number 4. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When I read the Bible, God sets me straight. The great thing about the Bible is I know if I read the Bible and I'm cattywampus with the Bible, I know the problem is not the Bible. I don't need to find another translation. What I need to do is get my heart in line with His heart. What I like about that is the assurance. Listen, sometimes it knocks the tar out of me. But I'm glad that I don't have to doubt that he's right. Which one's right? I'm not really sure. This is kind of how I'm feeling. No, when he says it's wrong, it's wrong, period. Doesn't matter if I like it or not. Doesn't matter if it feels good or not. See, it's not this, yea, hath God said. Does he really mean that? Wouldn't a better rendering be? Maybe if I look that up in the Hebrew and go to the trilateral root word, maybe I can find a word that better fits something more modern for me. You mean something you can duck out of. No, I like reading the Bible. And sometimes, i got to be honest with you, I don't like reading the Bible. Because sometimes the Lord says, hey, we need to have a little come to Jesus meeting. And sometimes, guess what? I'm wrong. Never one time have I found the Bible wrong. So I personally like that because I have an absolute authority. I might ask Brother Sam, say, hey, what do you think about this? He might actually love me and say, well, preacher, you know, I understand. And I know what the Bible says, but you know, I understand you got, uh, you know, situations and circumstances and you getting old and all that other kind of stuff. And, you know, give yourself a break or whatever. I like the Bible. There's plenty of verses like that in there, but he never says, oh, well, let's consider the circumstances. There's no situational ethics in the Bible. It's absolute. I, I like that. I know it's harsh sometimes. I do. I know sometimes it's like cut and dried. But I like that. It gives me great peace and assurance. I can go to the Bible and if I truly want to know the answer. Now here's the odd thing. If I really don't want the answer, I can search all day long and I can't seem to really get it settled. And the Lord said, see, you came with the wrong heart. You really didn't want an answer. You were looking for me to condone what you already wanted to do. That's not what you're going to find. If you really want to know the answer, I'll give you an answer. But if you don't, I'll let you continue to search in the dark. You can get out the searchlights and you'll never find it. Acts chapter number 13. Look in verse number 22. I mentioned this to you earlier. The Bible says, And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. After God removed Saul, you know what he said to David? He said, I want to utilize you if I can, please, if you'll allow me to. And even though David was a flawed human being, God still used him. David wasn't perfect. Isaiah 65, aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't require perfection? If he did, you could work your way to heaven. I'm, I'm glad for the grace. That I'll, I'll take it. I mean, I'm glad for grace, but I'm also glad for the grace that God gives us that gives me the ability to realize I don't have to be perfect to be pleasing to him. I come into heaven up there and the father says to the son, what is that? And the Lord said, it's a Heinz 57. He's about as messed up as a soup sandwich. He's not purebred anything. And the father says, well, we don't let them kind of dogs up here, Gentile dogs, right? We don't let them kind of dogs up here. They got fleas all over them, got the mange on them. They're, they're not good for anything up here, man. I mean, he's not even a good lap dog. He's, Get that dog out of here, man. What are they? And the Lord looks at him and said, but I like him. And you know why I get in? Because he lets me in. There's no merit to me whatsoever. Which one of us, when we get to heaven, going to be adding to heaven? <laughs> Isn't that, I'm glad to see you reacted that way. I mean, think about it. You know, yeah, I'm here now. Party can start, you know. 
I mean, I think we're going to walk in the door up there into that glorious place and the splendor, if it happens to be the New Jerusalem, but if right now it happens to be there in paradise, I think when we walk in there, I think we will be so awestruck, we will immediately feel like the least of the least of the least midgets. And we'll be like, hey, could you just like, duh, duh, duh. I don't want anybody to know I'm here. Right? I don't think it'll be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been preaching about this place for a while. Yeah, sure, I'm glad to be here. I wonder if Paul's around. I'd like to have a meeting with him. You ever hear people that arrogant? They say to you, yeah, when I get to heaven, I'm going to square off with the Lord. Help yourself. I will watch. I used to watch those fools jump in the ring around there when we used to have to watch the zip, the zam, and the rath, and the taz, and the bionic elbow, and all that other kind of stuff, and watch those fools wrestle around up there. I'll watch you wrestle around with him, but I ain't getting in the ring with you. I'm not about to stand up there and watch you. Lord, I got some questions to ask you. Man, how arrogant is that? Man, you get up there, you know what you realize? What an idiot for me to even say I'd ask him a question. Now, Paul, I'd like to talk to you about when you wrote this passage in Philippians. I'd like to know exactly what it was you were meaning to say. I'd like to have a discussion with you. You think you're going to open your mouth? I don't think so. But that arrogance tends to find its way into Bible believers as if heaven is going to revolve around us. Man, when you get there, you know what it's going to revolve around? Him. That's why I told you this morning, I mean, I'll be glad to come back, but I think the place will be so wonderful that you're thinking, you know what, compared to where I came from down here and compared to here, I don't want to go back there. I told you one time before that I was talking to a guy about the second coming and about the rapture and about how it was great. And his question at the end of a little brief dissertation that I had there, his question to me was this, do you think I'll be able to come check on my house in the millennium? I don't even know how to put my head around that. How do you, I mean, how do you, can I come check on my house in the millennium as if you think it's going to be fireproof or something? I mean, if you're in the United States, it's going to be smoked anyway. But after you've been up in the splendor of heaven, can I come by and check on my house? Boy, you talk about landlocked. Well, I want to see, I want to see how my, how my house is doing. Well, maybe you're planning on staying down here. I'm not. I'm going to come down here and be over there in Israel with the Lord doing whatever it is He tells me to do. And then heaven and earth are going to pass away. I promise I shouldn't think this, but I think to myself, Lord, if you give me the chance to see that guy when we get to heaven, when you smoke everything, I just want to be standing by him and just simply say to him, reckon how your house is doing now. Amen. You know, Lord, show him his house when it, when it just, you know, I mean... I know that's the devil in me, but I'm thinking, but I kind of understand that because Christianity has been mocked and made fun of so long that if you're sold out to it, you're considered to be a fanatic. It's been something that we've gotten into the mindset of the world and the world's mindset is, is Christianity is something you do when you don't have anything else to do. You marry them, you birth them, you bury them. Right? Did you notice the, early, the, 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 the order of things? You marry them, you birth them, you bury them. Did you get that? That was in t marriage before birth. Before, anyway, but, but have you ever noticed that now it's kind of like it's an inconvenience when it comes to a Christian who it's every day a part of their life. You get ready to sit down at the table and we're going to have something to eat, whether it be at lunch or whatever. Mind if I pray? Seriously? Yeah, mind if I pray? I mean, I know where the food came from. Yeah, you got paid and you paid the money. Yeah, but I know who paid me the money. Your boss did. No, you don't understand. If it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have this job. Hey, while we're jawing, I could be praying, right? But then you come to church and people are like, you got to go to church. I don't know how it's happened. Brother Sam does a great job putting the camps and stuff together. And the camps have continued to grow. But I'd like to say this, ladies and gentlemen. It's a day and time now where the kids are like, eh, we can go to a sports camp. And we can go to any kind of other things, but go into a church camp? Why, what are y'all going to do? Let somebody yell at me for a couple days? Put up my phone, put up my other stuff, sing some hymns, try to have the right kind of fellowship and try to get the kinks worked out of my head and my heart? And most kids are like, yeah, you know, can I wear my... No, you can't. You see, I don't want to do that. They're trying to restrain me. Yeah, we are. That's right. That, that's what we're trying to do. Keep the cup full. But have you noticed it's sort of gotten, shall I say, 
lackadaisical in the commitment of people to the Lord nowadays. They talk about Jesus when they're around other people talking about Jesus. Otherwise, you don't hear a peep out of them. You notice what's happened? Even if you look at Pew Research, the, 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 the numbers of people attending church and reading their Bible and stuff, it's fallen way off. The number of actual believers in the second coming, it's fallen way off. The number of people that actually believe in hell, it's fallen way off. You say, what's happening? Their hearts are in different places now, and now it's a matter of, you know, we don't want to be like those fanatics because you're toward the end of the age and now all of a sudden being a Christian on not just Sunday morning but Sunday night and Wednesday night and Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, Friday and Saturday, boy is that going the way of the American Indian. Something that we do when we have to do it and come to a wedding for, come to the church for a wedding, come to church for a funeral, but you know any other time, maybe a christening if you're Catholic or something like that, but going to church every Sunday? That used to be a way of life for even people that were lost. Sunday it was shut down. Now, you, you noticed, traffic on Sunday is just like any other day. You know what I've wanted to do sometimes is just holler out, hey, I wonder how many of y'all are saved. And doing whatever you're doing on Sunday. Well, I ain't going to church. I don't have to go to church. And all that kind of, no problem. But boy, and this is a smart aleck remark. You'll have a tough time when you get to heaven because it's church every day. Look, if you will, please, um, if you've gotten to Isaiah yet, 65, look, if you will, please, in verse number 14. I, I think that the lackadaisical attitude that has happened among Christians has now become almost epidemic. It's like in a, in a, in a bad battle situation. One of the reasons that they used to shoot deserters is, is because desertion can become epidemic. And when one begins to run, other people begin to run. And, and then you can't ever hold the line when that happens. And I'm beginning to see that falling away take place from people that used to be in church all the time. And now all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I just don't really think that's that big of a deal. And literally something I'm talking to you about tonight is it's not a very popular subject. That going to church really does matter. You know, well, I don't agree with you. That's said by somebody who doesn't go. And they want to argue about it. Well, I'm not going to argue. One guy told me flatly, he said, the only reason you go is you get paid. So, okay, what are you going to say? I do get paid. But, but if you think that's why I'm here, there's about 10 years that <laughs> that wasn't occurring. And, and do, you, do you understand? I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. I'm not doing this for a paycheck. But, I mean, if I wanted a bigger paycheck, I could certainly change some of the sermons a little bit and certainly not preach as long because you get paid the same for 15 minutes as you do for an hour and 15 minutes. I mean, I know how to get a raise, just shorten the sermon. They asked Brother Brad, how much are you paying that guy? He will never shut up. You know, we pay him the same thing for 15 minutes as an hour and 15 minutes. But, but here's what's beginning to happen. Nowadays, it's beginning to get to the place where Christians, so-called saved people, they don't want anything to do with church. And they know they're reading it in the Bible. You say, what's the problem? It's a heart problem. It's how they're thinking. And they have convinced themselves that it doesn't matter to God, even though he did die for the church. Isaiah 65, jump all the way down, if you will, please, to verse number, oh, make it 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you that the heart is the seat of your emotions. And for any Christian that doesn't believe that emotions is part of the Christian life, you're completely wrong. It's a part of everything that you do. I recognize Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. Ecclesiastes number 2. I realize without any question that there's a times when you have these things called, you know, wildfire breaking out and people acting the fool and stuff like that. And I've been in some meetings before where, to me, it got a little bit, uh, for, for at least for me, got a little carried away. You know, I don't know if they're in the flesh or not in the flesh, and I don't mind them letting the string out. But you know what? Life's not that way. It's not always a mountaintop. Have you all learned that by now? There's two valleys for every mountaintop. 
and I like to shout, and I, I do, I enjoy shouting and amen, and I like to jump up every now and then and so on and so forth. I've, I've seen some meetings, they, they turn into, they almost look like a riot and things like that, and they call that spiritual. But if you set the plow down and you just preach some things about Christian living and about what the Lord would have you to do, they don't shout the same way. Sometimes that shout can be a cover-up for you're losing the game, but we're still shouting to make you think we're winning. <laughs> right? And so I'm, I'm all for shouting. I like to shout. I mean, I get, got pretty loose in here this morning. I like that. It charges me up. And the more you do that, the longer I preach. I like that. I don't have any problem with that. So don't stop doing it. But, but, but what I want you to understand is, is emotion is a part of who you are. Do you ever get angry about anything? Thank you, Miss Barbara. Everybody else is like, oh, no, I have perfect control over my temper. We're going to call your wife to testify. <laughs> you can't. I'm protected. Husband and wife are protected in a court of law. Yeah, but we just wanted to find out if you're telling the truth. I mean, you don't have control of your emotion all the time. You ever cry? See, I don't ever cry. Go home and watch Old Yeller. <laughs> or go home and watch Where the Red Fern Grows. I think we should show that at camp this year after all the preaching and watch all these kids. Where are the red fern grows? I don't. Yeah, when little Dan lays over there on the grave of little Ann and he puts his head. Uh, oh, man. I mean, you know, you, you might think you can keep from it. And I still hate the cat that killed old Yeller. It is emotional. All right, boys, I'll put you on the spot here, okay? Are you in love with your wife? The, the correct answer is yes, I am. It's not just a verb, it's an emotion. Try this, I love you. See how that works out for you on your next anniversary, right? Yeah, I love you. And I'll let you know if that changes. I told you that 40 years ago. That's not going to play well for you, I'm just telling you. Do you ever, when the kids score a goal or they do something great, does it ever make you feel a sense of pride or joy that your kids succeeded? I mean, they came home and they brought a D home instead of an F. Are you like, yes, you passed. I'm so glad, right? I was thinking you were going to repeat the grade. Do you ever, that's an emotion. In the Christian life, you know what happens? Sometimes there's sadness. Jesus wept. But Jesus also talks about joy. That's an emotion. There are things that he wants you to experience. He realizes we're not flatliners. You're not spiritual just because you sit there and you never have any show of emotion. You're showing emotion right there. Or you're dead. Maybe we need to call the mortician and get you embalmed. But some... you. like a blinking frog in a hailstorm. Why? I'm spiritual, as one fellow told me. He says, I'm spiritual. I ain't supposed to be shouting in church. So I run through about 10 verses where they, even the rocks will cry out if you don't. And I give him the verses over where uh, the, in the Old Testament where they're shouting and stuff like that. I'm not trying to invoke it. I'm saying, do you ever get excited about the Lord the way you get excited about the races? Yeah. A fella came out of Alabama who was in a meeting over there and, you know, it got kind of good and all that kind of stuff. And he comes by the door and he's got this grimace on his face, man. I mean, he is just like really sad. And so he shook his, took his hand out, you know, and I'm shaking hands. I said, hello, sir, how are you doing? He said, fine. I said, okay, could have fooled me. But, you know, all that kind of thing. He says, I don't appreciate all that shouting going on in here. You kind of loud too. I said, could I ask you just one quick question? I'm still holding his hand. And he said, yeah, I reckon. I said, okay. I said, do you go to the race car races? NASCAR races? He's trying to pull his hand up now. <laughs> he looks like a rabbit caught in a trap, you know, and he's pulling. And I said, do you sit there with that grimace on your face at NASCAR? I said, you mean you get more excited about somebody coming around, Dale Earnhardt around turn number three, and here he comes, boy, and he's got the hammer down, and he's got a hard card lead by, and it looks like that's Dale Earnhardt that comes through. <laughs> you ever met Dale Earnhardt a day in your life? All you know him is by the name on the car. It could be a stinking clone in there for all you know. You don't know who's in that car. You see his name on the car. I like Dale. Like, like you know Dale who happens to be from Kannapolis, North Carolina. 
Did you know that? They got a statue of him in the middle of town up there. <laughs> Kannapolis. Some of you don't even, that's where Cannon Mill Company used to be. That's what, wow. He's actually from Concord, I guess it is, which is one town over, one place over. But, but, I, but I asked him that. I said, do you ever get excited about that? I thought he was going to do the handball, man. I mean, I <laughs> pulled his hand away from me and walked out. He didn't come the rest of the meeting. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Christian life is emotion. There are times when God touches your heart and if tears don't come down your cheeks, something's wrong with you. And there are times when God touches your heart and you can't help but just say, praise the Lord. Man, God, that's good. This boy gets up here. I know a little bit about him. He gets up here and gets to singing. <laughs> here he is. He's a contractor. He's a really good professional painter. He gets covered from head to toe in paint and stuff like that and lays around on his back like Michelangelo on a scaffolding and stuff in the hot of the heat of the day and all that. I come to the garden alone. <laughs> You're thinking, what is that? He's so jacked up he can't even hardly get the words out. What is that? It's emotion. It touched your heart, didn't it? Are you touched by the professionalism or were you touched by the heart? It's by the heart. Absolutely. You could tell his heart was in it, couldn't you? You were cheering him on. That's what you're supposed to do. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Is it making any sense to you? Emotion is part of it. Remember I told you in Proverbs, we won't go back over there now. I've got to hurry. But remember he said over in Proverbs, heaviness of heart. Depression comes in. That's an emotion. And by the way, let me just touch this real quick for just three shakes of a sheep's tail. You got to recognize in a day and time which you are, things are set up to make people depressed. Yeah. And then on top of that, they're trying to convince you you are depressed and that you're a psychiatrist and you can self-diagnose if you happen to have this. You could have bumped your head on the door when you came inside and then you turn on the TV and say, does your head hurt? <laughs> are you depressed? Honey, I must be depressed. I got this knot on my head. Baby, you ain't depressed. You hit your head on the door. How do you know I hit my head on the door? Because I'm the one that slammed it. But <laughs> you're not depressed. You're just stupid, right? But, but, but here's the thing. Please don't ignore that. That's a very real thing. If a preacher as great as Elijah can be in the throes of depression... Don't see yourself as somebody, oh, I think that's a woman's disease or something. Oh, no, it's not. It's the real deal. Pay attention to that. And if that's, you need to get help with that, then you get you some help with that. Don't try to hide it or cover it up. It'll eat you alive. Sometimes it's okay to be sad, but you got to get a point in time where you enough of that and move on. I heard a lady say something the other day. She lost her two of her sons in a real bad situation that took place. You know, she said it was profound. She said, I can't spend all my time spending time grieving for the dead and ignore the living. I told my wife, I said, I'll see you at the altar. I thought, boy, you got to be, what a Christian testimony. I can't spend so much time grieving for the dead that I ignore the living. She said, I got three other children. Just one little statement stuck with me. Boy, I'm thinking, my goodness, man. Now, most of you Southerners, you wouldn't appreciate that at all. <laughs> but you know what the Lord said? Let the dead bury the dead. You know what that lady finished up the statement with? She said, I know this. If the Bible's right, I'm going to see him again. I thought, my goodness, ma'am, you, you are teaching me a thing or two. If the Bible's right, I'm going to see him again. Okay, fine. Well, then let's move on. It's emotional. Can I just say, don't ignore those feelings. Did I give you the one in Ecclesiastes? I don't think I gave it to you yet. I think I gave the passage, but I hadn't given you. Now, chapter 2, look in verse number 20. Notice, uh, we'll make it 19, uh, talking about vanity. He ends there, I've labored in wherein I showed myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. You ought to read Ecclesiastes sometimes and just ignore that last couple of verses in chapter 12, you know, where the Lord goes and, and, uh, and exposes every thought that you have. Every thought. 
The Lord knows the secrets. But then notice what he says in verse number 20. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair. This is the wisest man that ever lived. Cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. You know what he said? He said that their heart is a place of emotion and your heart can have sorrow in it. John chapter number 16 says, sorrow has filled your heart. Look at it real quick. John chapter 16, I think it'll be around verse 6 or 7 there. Don't ignore those emotions. Keep your anger under control. One of the things that we'll be uh, preaching about during youth camp is one of the things you're supposed to add to your faith is temperance. That's the last thing there with the Holy Spirit or the fruits of the Holy Spirit there in Galatians chapter 5. But temperance, ladies and gentlemen, is not just controlling your anger. It's learning how to be supple enough to bend without breaking. It's a good balance for your Christian life so that you don't let everything just snap you in half. Some Christians are just looking for a reason to get out. So the first thing that comes along to give them an excuse to get out, they just get out. You say, when they just snap under pressure. When you get a good knife, and I've had a few of them in my lifetime, and you get a good knife, that thing has tempered steel on it. Regular steel, when it comes out, if you put any pressure on that thing, you'll break the end off of the blade at the very end, or you'll snap that thing off because it's too hard. It has to have some temper. That means it bends and it springs back. It doesn't just bend and stay bent. It bends and then it springs back. And it keeps that edge for a long period of time. You say, what is that? That's tempered steel. That should be the Christian life. You should keep your, you keep your edge and you should be able to bend, not break under pressure and not always be ready to just snap at any moment. Just, just, just mad, just mad all the time. Well, you got a problem with your heart. Sorrow hath filled your heart. Look in John chapter number 16. Uh, come down to verse number, it is 6. The Bible says this, But now go my way unto him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. You know what happens? You can get a heavy heart. Can't you? James chapter number 3. This is a good one. I gave you this one the other day, but it bears repeating. And I don't know if it's because it's humid outside or what, but it's hot in here to me. Does it feel still to you? Can you just turn the fans on to make me think it's cooler? Please, sir. I'd appreciate that. James chapter number three. Isn't it a blessing to be able to hit a button and turn on the air conditioner? I remember we was in the Philippines. I think it was the first time that, um, let's see, I went over with Jim. I think it was the first time Drina went over there with me. And uh, it was 110 degrees, straight up temperature, not feels like 110 degrees, and 100% uh, humidity. We were in uh, uh, Paponga, no, we were in Tarlac. And they had a little building there about the size of the platform right here, maybe a little bit wider than that. And they had benches in there, concrete blocks with uh, two by sixes turned over on the top of them there for people to, to sit on them and that kind of thing. And you're up there, and I don't have any idea why, but I had on something that was sort of an olive color, sort of a greenish color, which I'd never do, look like khakis or something. And I'm up there preaching, and they don't want you to preach there uh, with a tie because it's Seventh-day Adventist Jehovah's Witness. And so you do follow what they're wanting you to do. And so I had taken my, uh, my tie off there and I'm preaching and I got on a coat. And man, by the time I got done, it looked like you had hit me with a water hose. And they said, uh, it's a little bit warm, turn on the fan. <laughs> and they had one fan in the middle of that building, would have been about right here. And it's one of those that had, you know, those little baby blades on it, about 12 inches long. So a total of 24 inches. And that thing is running, it sounds like a hair, an airplane fixing to take off. It's going like that and, and I, it ain't moving nothing. That air was so heavy man. I mean nothing is moving. I'm sitting there. I'm having to wipe my hands before I turn my pages and wipe my hands. Sweat's dripping off of me. We were having a great time though. <laughs> and then I think about this. It gets a little bit warm. Could you turn on the air conditioner please? <laughs> yeah I sure do miss those are good days. James chapter number 3. Look if you will please in verse number 14. Trying to hurry. But if you have bitter envying and strife, where? Who would have ever thought that could be there? In your hearts. And lie not against the truth. Why? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, 
sensual and devilish. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Look at the verse carefully. Envy and strife, where is it at? What's the source of it? Look at it. Earthly, sensual, devilish. Confusion, every evil work. So here's my question to you. What's the source of the bitter envy and strife? So guess what? Your heart can be filled with man's thoughts or the devil's thoughts. Your heart is not protected from being convinced against what God says. He said, I'm going to give you a warning. If you got bitter and envy and that didn't come from me, what happens earthly, sensual, devilish? So now what I've got to do, I've got to check my heart. I need to get my heart cleaned out. What do I do? I've got to clear out my heart, think the way God thinks, and guess what? Then he tells me in the passage how I can get the wisdom that descended is first pure, then peaceable. If I remember the passage right, easy to be entreated. Isn't that what's there? But it's first what? Pure. The other one comes from an impure source. Father, I pray that you might help us take these things and consider them all that we've been talking about now for a month or so and that we might apply them before we have to revisit them again. Help us to recognize the need to keep our heart in line with your heart. And ask, Lord, that you'll bless these folks and watch over them, care for them, and uh, help them, Lord. Help all of us to have you in our heart first and foremost to let it be filled so much with you that the other stuff can't find a way to get in there. I pray you'll be with us as we go talk to a couple hundred kids this week during the youth camp up there in Indiana. Would you give us safe passage up there and protect us as we go and come? Protect all the young'uns up there and don't let us have any tragedies or any problems or difficulties. Pray you'll go ahead and begin now to prepare the hearts of all the kids that'll be coming in a couple of weeks to get down there to camp that we're gonna have here in Florida. I pray you'll be with uh, Brother Holland as he continues to move the building along at warp speed so we can get that ready to go for the meeting. Thank you, Lord, for the folks that came down from New York today and New Jersey today and the other visitors that we had that have been here with us in Pennsylvania and other places. And for all the people that have been watching, would you please bless them and watch over them. Let them know how much we appreciate it. Be with our missionaries that are out on the fields that are continuing to try their best in uncertain times to to plow the fields that you've given them to plow. Help them to be able to put some seed out and let them see some fruit for their labor, Lord. Would you please bless them? Bless every preacher that opens his mouth and he begins to preach from your book. Would you give him supernatural unction from on high? Watch over these folks. Be with them. Comfort them, Lord, where they need comfort and encourage them where they need encouragement. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.